Hello and welcome to Property Matters. I'm Stephen Galpin and in today's program we're going to discuss a new and entrepreneurial way of investing in property via an IPO. That's an initial public offering of shares and in particular for commercial property. In other words, a stock exchange for real estate. Joining me today is the CEO of IPSX, Roger Clark, the man in charge of operations. Roger, welcome. Hi Stephen, thank you and hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, well, this really is entrepreneurial, isn't it? Um, is this the first time a, a sort of exchange has taken place? Well, I would say yes and no. Uh, what we're doing is we're fractionalizing the ownership of large pieces of real estate, large buildings, portfolios of buildings. So let me just, I was just going to use the word fractional ownership and I thought I better not, Roger might not like it. And then, well, <laughs> yeah, and, and in, in a way it is, and it does sound a little bit modern. It sounds a little bit like um, tokenization and crypto. But of course, all it really means is breaking down one big asset yeah. into fractions. It's what stock exchanges do. It's yeah. what stock exchanges do for companies. And people have been wanting to do this for real estate for, gosh, 50, 50 years. But for various reasons, it hasn't happened and it hasn't worked till now. OK, well, l let's just start off at the beginning. So to explain to our viewers, very, very simply, it's a way of bringing a particular commercial property to a market for people to buy you know, a fractional share of it in terms of shares. And you are stating that you're the first regulated um, share exchange stock market for this sort of proposition. What does regulated actually mean? What, so if I want to put some money into these shares and perhaps pop them in my pension, which you know, perhaps wouldn't normally be available to me on, on sort of single real estate transaction basis, what am I protected from? Is my money protected with you? Is there some sort of scheme to say that, you know, if this doesn't go quite right? Well, interestingly, no, there isn't necessarily that. And of course, with any market, there, there, there should risk. be, you know, but the, the small print does talk about prices can go down as well as up. Right. But that's a different story. We can talk about that later on, about, about how pure and true we think the pricing on our exchange is. But what does regulation mean? Well, we are what's known as a recognized exchange under the FCA. There are only six of those that exist. It's a very small group of very highly accredited and highly approved exchanges. It means that if something lists on our market, uh, the filing documents, the prospectus, will be very thorough. It'll have been put together by lawyers, accountants, uh, property valuers, investment bankers, and it will have everything in there that you need to know and nothing will be missing that you should know. It's a very high level of information and it's pre-approved by the FCA. So the, so the FCA have checked it and they've given it a stamp. It's known as stamping it off. Okay, so no, no over-claiming, no um, exaggerated claims of returns or prospects. No, and of course that's quite important because some of your viewers may have come across, and I'm not gonna name any names, some are better than others, will have come across various crowdfunding platforms or have been the mini bond scandals, we, we don't make any promises here that aren't backed up by accountants' reports and by investment bankers. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely the same as buying shares on the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange in terms of the quality of disclosure and due diligence. Really important, and that's the protection that regulation gives. Okay, so this is, I suppose, solving a problem of those people who have shall we say, limited capital to invest, but want to invest in the commercial world of property, um, it's an opportunity for them to do so with some protection, as you say, by the scrutiny of the, of the listing document, but also by really understanding what they're investing in. I mean, I, I have a friend who is involved in crowdfunding for some time, and he said, oh my goodness, he said, what you don't realize is it's very, very attractive to attract all these crowdfunding investors who don't really look at anything terribly closely, just chuck their money into a pot. And he said, you then spend the next two or three years trying to either pacify them or taking 300 phone calls a day explaining what, what's going on. Well, this is far more simplistic in terms of being closely associated to the particular product, isn't it? it yeah, we, we like to sort of think of ourselves as, a, as um, an asset exchange, if you like, yeah, where yeah. we're giving um, investors the chance to buy into assets rather than just buy a company where you have to trust the, the management completely 
to make the decisions for you. What it really comes down to, Stephen, is something I hear all the time from investors, we want control. And we've seen this in the wake of the COVID changes that we all went through, is the huge rise in people wanting to invest their own money and make their own decisions. There's still a place in the world. If you don't want to choose whether to buy a building A over building B, you can go to a, uh, you can go and buy funds, you can buy mm. REITs. There's still a place for people who don't want to take control of their own portfolio. Sure. But increasingly people do, and we're making that possible. Well, that's quite interesting because one, one of the criticisms of, of many, many funds to do with pensions or future securities is, is that you can, if you're not careful, end up paying huge amount of fees in terms of management, control, compliance, um, and actually your investment gets so greatly diluted, especially in the first few years, that, that you know it almost becomes not worthwhile doing. And as you say, you've got very little control, whereas this seems to me absolutely ideal. But it, this brings me on to the next sort of dual question, if you like. What sort of people would you attract to invest in a particular project? Where would they come from? Who would introduce them? And secondly, where would your assets come from? What sort of real estate company would allow you to take over their asset to market in this way? So two part well, question. So the investors, we, we've, we, one of the things that comes from us being an FCA recognized exchange means it could be any investor. So it really can be um, the, 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 the very um, smallest retail investor putting 500 pounds in their eyes. It doesn't have to be what's termed a sort of sophisticated investor. No, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't need to be a high net worth individual. Mm. It's one of the things we fought very hard. It was a long road to get regulated to this level, but we wanted to make it truly a democratizing product. Yeah. Democratic. We wanted to really open up real estate, which is su such big assets that you have to be running tens or hundreds of millions of pounds to buy the sort of buildings around here where we're sitting today. We wanted to make it possible for anyone to own a little bit of these these amazing buildings. So anybody could come. How do you how do we find them? How does the distribution happen? Well, through the the platforms, the the, the execution only platforms that everyone is increasingly familiar with, like um, AJ Bell or Interactive Investors. Um, through you mentioned earlier, through SIP providers, you ask your your SIP administrators will all have access to our deals. Um, small stockbrokers, whoever you use for your advice, um, whether it, it's a regional stockbroker, right the way up to the biggest wealth managers. If you if you um, just have a savings product with Bruin Dolphin, Bruin Dolphin can trade shares on our market. And of course, lastly, I would say if you speak to your IFA, if you ask them, they can they can find a way into into our, our products. So investors can come from everywhere. What sort of properties are we looking for? Again, the answer is a little bit everywhere in the sense that we're just a, a venue that people can list property on and investors can buy property on. We don't really make a choice that we, we have that level of regulatory protection, quality disclosure I mentioned. But within that, you know, we're not saying we're not open to retail, we're only for offices. We're not, we're not open for residential, we're only for logistics. We're, we're open for anything that investors want to buy. We are talking to the investors across the whole spectrum. And what we particularly like are well-known assets that have an income, <coughs> excuse me, that are rented and are producing income because ultimately I think this is perfect for investors to put into their portfolio as a source of income mm. uh, rather than a source of high risk development. So, so there should be pretty well an instant return rather than having to wait for something to be developed or? Yeah, developers can use our exchange and, 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 and will do in time. Indeed, one of the things we already have listed on our exchange is, is a three year development project. But that's the exception that proves the rule. I think for most of your viewers, what they should assume you get from IPSX is a nice, stable dividend yield from a nice, safe, asset-backed piece of property that, yeah, properties can go down in value. We've seen, and we've talked about this before, we've seen properties go down in value in the UK in the last 12 months. 
But on the whole, property is a safe source of income, and that's what we're offering. Well, I did, I, I did have a conversation with one of our development uh, contributors the other day, and I said, well, of course, I live in a very expensive flat across the road. And he said, no, you did. <laughs> 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 the market's not good at the moment. Yeah. But no, I, I, I mean, this sort of thing sounds ideal for the smaller investor because he's joining like-minded investors um, in a project that is managed by competent real estate people as well as people just distributing shares you you have a competence in the industry and i think that's quite important isn't it that's super important because whoever is going to be retained as the manager the the, the asset management advisor to the company that owns the property that or properties that are listed on our exchange they are responsible for making sure that the rent is collected the dividends get paid the the light bulbs are changed the refurbishments are done and that's really important because it's just like thinking about your home if you don't look after it it, mm. it, it starts to suffer so very important that the best in class asset managers are involved and 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 they are Yes. I mean, and again, I don't keep using the comparison with crowdfunding, but it is an alternative source for a small investor. But, you know, again, a lot of the crowdfunding companies I've looked at, I'm not going to say they're all tied with the same brush, you, you do question the knowledge of some of the managers of these funds. They might be very competent fund managers, but not necessarily very competent property managers. They will then say, oh, well, that we've subcontracted out, we've sent it out to this person or that company, and they're all very competent. But, of course, that, again, is administrative cost, isn't it, which is coming off the investment. And, again, not always to the benefit of the smaller investor. There's always going to be a little bit of cost involved in running a, a, a mm. public company. Um, that, that is for sure. And, of course, that's, that's in, a, in a way, when I think of it from my point of view, Stephen, you know, I, w would I like to be the person responsible for collecting the rent and, and uh, re, re, re negotiating leases and looking for new tenants? No, I want to pay someone who's an expert to do that. Um, yeah. The question is how much is too much and how much is an appropriate amount? And, and, and we see that on our market where what it comes through to is you start with a property yield. There's a company that has some cost, but not very much cost. It's it's a really um, transparent and efficient structures that pays out a dividend. And we see the stocks trading currently on our exchange are paying um, dividends anything up to eight percent. So mm -hmm. um, we think that's a, an, ex an an acceptable rate of return for investors. Well, that's, that sounds very good. Okay. Well, um, look, Roger, we're going to take a commercial break now. So after the break, what I want to talk to you about are some of the people's reservations about the scheme that you do. You have a new scheme has people who are rather critical and perhaps sometimes unfairly critical of, uh, of a new scheme. I want to just have a look at that. What are some of the pitfalls, but also what are some of the benefits and what really sets you aside from other people? So I'm Stephen Galpin. I'm with Roger Clark. Join me again after the break when we'll be looking at IPO offerings for commercial real estate. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Matters. I'm Stephen Galpin and I'm joined by Roger Clark, who is the CEO of IPSX and uh, in charge of operations of their new um, IPO operation, which is bringing commercial real estate at the moment to the market, allowing small investors to take shares and invest in this sort of industry, which has been a little bit restricted in the past. And also talking to Roger in the break, maybe a spread to into residential sectors. So the first thing I want to ask you, um, Roger, in this half of the show, um, I'm sure with any new entrepreneurial exercise, you're going to get your critics. So what are your critics saying about this particular deal? So tell me that and then tell me what your answers are to put them down. Sure, I think um, it, we're, we're, we're creating something new. Yeah. And the real estate industry has been working the way it works for hundreds of years. So some, some people are finding it a little bit unfamiliar. Dare one say some people are finding it a little bit threatening. Things I often hear, that uh, it's too complicated, uh, that it's too expensive, and that it takes too long to uh, complete an IPO on our, our exchange. Those are probably the three most often 
um, hard criticisms. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I think I could counter some of those. I mean, I think we were, uh, I, I think you kindly selected us to do a live presentation of your first offering, if I, if I remember correctly, which we, we broadcast live, I think. And um, I, I, I was really impressed with the speed of the way it went, the efficiency that it went with, and very clear to understand, very very open to everybody, I thought. Well, that's that's terrific to hear that, Stephen. But yeah, and I, I think that's the thing. I think, you know, so, some of the things that have come to our market have been in the public domain before the transaction closed for quite a long time. But look, the reality is, uh, you know, I often say to someone, if they said, what do I need to do to get ready to do a transaction on your market? The first and most important thing is, you have to make sure the company or the assets that you want to list is is ready, yeah. is ready. That anything that needs to be done to get the, the asset ready for the public markets is is completed. And, and what happens if you don't do that is the transaction gets delayed. It gets delayed whilst things are fixed and sorted out. We've seen a bit of that. Um, I mean, sorry, the, the last thing you want is a million questions, isn't it? You know, the, the, your perspective needs to answer every question before somebody asks it. That's, that's the intention if it's, if it's well written. And of course it has to, as we mentioned earlier, it has to go through the FCA, the regulator beforehand. They'll ask a lot of questions if anything's unclear. So that's, 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 there's a confusion between the process being difficult and dare one say the asset not being ready yet mm, to start yeah. the process. Um, that's the, the main thing. In terms of the, so the complexity of the process as well, it's not actually that complex. It, as we mentioned, it might be unfamiliar to people who are used to buying and selling real estate through estate agents, mm. but there's a whole industry. Here we are sitting in Canary Wharf. There's a lot of it just out there over the water. Yeah. That it knows exactly how IPOs work. It's what they do day in, day out. It's what London is famous for globally. And so the process is not that unfamiliar. Uh, it's not that complicated. Um, and it isn't actually that much more expensive than owning real estate through any other kind of structure. There's some cost involved in, in having someone else manage real estate for you, whether it's private or public. Um, so those are the main things we hear, and those are the main mitigating sort of answers to, to those points. I mean, the, the other interesting thing that sort of occurs to me in terms of your appraisal of whether something's good to bring to the market, I mean, it, you're dealing with, in most cases, a finished product, perhaps a, a, a mall or... I, I don't know, a shopping precinct or an office block. Um, it's already been developed. It's already had funding. Somebody's already had confidence in it. Um, so actually, quite a lot of the risk is taken out by the fact that it's there. I mean, I, I can remember going back in Canary Wharf, Surrey Keys years ago. Um, I, I worked with Sir Terence Conran at one time, and he actually designed, I think, if I if I remember correctly, the Surrey Keys operation over there. And everybody said, oh, it'll never work, it'll never work. What do you mean it'll never work? What are they going to do? Pull it down, burn it down, bulldoze it and put something else there? I worked for the receivers on Canary Wharf here when the bank said Canary Wharf will never work. Well, I, I live here and I'm, I'm loath to go into Canary Wharf at the weekends now because it's no longer a ghost town. It's actually a crowded nightmare. And, you know, we have some of the highest grossing shops here for the, you know, per brand. And I mean, it works extremely well. So as I say, I think the fact that some things are already created and you're then bringing them to a, a remarket, I, I, I think that's quite a good safety valve in itself. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make. It's often the case, you know, that, that if people think of invest, investment markets and there are people prepared to take more risk and they want more returns. Uh, and you, you know, when you look at property in particular, the property developers want a certain return. And then when they've had it, there's, there are institutions, there are insurance companies, life insurers, retail investors who need maybe a, a slightly lower return. And, you know, Canary Wharf, where we're sitting today, is a great example of that. As you say, you're, you're quite right. I was talking to one of the people who works at Canary Wharf Group just the other day. And I, exactly as you say, some of the best performing stores in the whole of the UK are here now. Yeah. And, and that, is, that is a great thing to invest in. Well, I, I was quite lucky to interview one of the guys that was one of the first people in, involved in the commercial letting of Canary Wharf. And I said, why, why is it that your malls are so successful? Because there's very little 
um, empty property. There's very little sort of void there. And he said, well, we, t we took a slightly different attitude to start with. He said, rather than go for the biggest shops that paid the biggest rents for the longest period of time, he said, I looked at the demographics of who was working in Canary Wharf, and I went out to find the shops that would match those demographics. And I thought, you know, how refreshing. And it's really, really worked. And if you can find assets like that to bring to your market, you're going to have success all the way down the line, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think it's an interesting point you make. One, I, I mean, I, as you could imagine, I speak to investors a lot at the moment, every day. And one of the things I completely keep hearing, one of the things that's changing and I think is really refreshing about real estate is people no longer think of, I need some real estate in my portfolio, I'll buy an M&G balance fund or I'll buy British land shares. People understand there are differences between student accommodation and retail. They understand there's a difference between retail at Canary Wharf and retail at Lakeside. Yeah. And they're just beginning to be far more intelligent about what they want from property and what sort of property they want. And we're tapping into that because we're now beginning to provide people the chance to make their own choices, and their own control, and buy and sell when it suits them. It's absolutely the direction that capital markets are going in, more self-control more self-investing decisions. And I think it's really exciting that people seem ready for that with property now. Now, that brings me to the next question, which I'm quite interested to see. What, what are the stages that one goes through to, to, to bring a property to market with, with, with your uh, um, endeavours? Now, let's imagine I'm, I, 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 I'm a freeholder, I own an office block, I'm thinking I do want to sell it, I'm you know getting old now, so I'm out of it, I want a bit of peace and quiet. Um, I go to my agents, they will give me advice on price and what my expectations may be. Does your advice differ from that of an agent? So would I come to you as an alternative if I don't like what the agent tells me? Or would I come to you as a first choice to say, this is actually a speedy and more efficient way of selling my property? Just the difference between the two. I think uh, I think there's potentially a bit of all, all of the above in the answer. Certainly, agents are involved in the process of IPSX because at, when a, a prospectus is published and it's been reviewed by the FCA, one of the things it has to include in it is a valuation report mm. signed by one of the agents. So there's a, there's an absolute up to date document saying this is what the building is worth. Um, now, when someone says to you that a building is worth something, that tends to be the price it trades at. But of course, it, it might trade at a better price than that to a, if you split it up and sell it to more investors who may yeah. be then getting more focused on the cash flows that come from it. So it's a different sort of audience. Um, and again, it will depend on the, the asset. It will depend on what the owner wants. A lot of the owners, Stephen, that we're speaking to, and this is really, really important, a lot of the owners we're speaking to don't want to sell the whole building. What they'd like to do is take a little bit of capital out of it, take a little bit of risk out of it, but still keep it. One of the things we see, we, one of the conversations we have lots and lots of at the moment is with family offices who don't want to sell assets. Their, their, their family wants to grow the assets and keep them for many generations. But people need cash at times for certain things. We now provide something that the agents can't. We provide those owners with the chance to take a little bit of money out of a building without losing control of it. Okay, well that actually answers my final question to you because I was going to say, well, okay, so I make the choice, I discard my agents and I think, no, I'm, I'm going to go with Roger because I, I like what he's telling me, I like the idea, I like the concept and I'm very pleased to have a number of people taking over my building to, to look after it. But let's say that the offering isn't quite as successful or quite as full as one might imagine at the beginning and let's say half of it gets sold okay what about the other half do i wait for it will it come trickling in over time is that something i must take into account if i use your system to sell or are the ways of accelerating uh, uh, um, that exchange of shares for, for property and property for shares um, d does that mean that I'm going to have to reduce the price of those shares and therefore my overall revenue. How does that final little bit work? So again, all of those, all of those outcomes you just alluded to are, are, are potentially possible. And of course, the owner in that sense would be, would be taking financial advice. They would have appointed a, 
a, a lawyer and, a, and an investment banker mm-hmm. who can tell them what the, what, what the implications might be if they go down certain routes. But t- at its simplest, um, what you set out is correct, that uh, you could choose, and it's often the case that a, a book builder, an investment bank who, who, who builds this book of demand for an IPO, mm-hmm. will be saying to someone, you know, at a certain price, I could sell it all for you. At a higher price, I can't quite sell it all, but I could sell three quarters of it. At this mm. price, I could, and you can then choose. Well, what, you know, maybe I sell half of it now, and I carry on delivering the rent, carry on delivering the growth of this asset. Other things being equal, you expect its price is going to go up, and you still own half of it. You can sell those shares into a rising market in the future. So that that degree of flexibility. And that degree of choice, both today and in the future, is very attractive to a lot of the owners sure, of real estate yeah. we're talking to. I don't actually see it as a downside. And no. I, think, I think the other thing that we should probably make clear to our viewers is that as, as an operation, you don't give advice. Um, you will probably tend to send somebody away to get their own advice. And it, it could very well be on that very subject of, of uh, at what stage do you want to accelerate or deaccelerate the sale of shares and investment in the property. Yeah, I, here, here I would say it's just, just the same as any other exchange in London. If you are, if you are Vodafone, for example, um, doing a transaction on the London Stock Exchange, it's your investment bank, that's Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, whoever it is, that you get advice from. The Stock Exchange is just where, where, you, where you do it. And, and so we're, we're equivalent to that. Roger, thank you very much for coming in. That was very informative, very interesting, and I'm sure a great benefit and interest to the full spectrum of investors across the real estate market. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time for Property Matters. Look forward to seeing you then.